You probably heard that the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan recently started dumping radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Japan will soon begin the process of releasing radioactive water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. China has already reacted by banning all seafood. This may seem alarming at first, but the truth is, it doesn't matter as much as people think. It's not great, but it's not terrible. And you won't be seeing any three-eyed fish swimming around anytime soon, and there are five reasons why. The first is that the amount and concentration of the radioactive contamination in the water being released is almost nothing. In fact, in most countries, it would be perfectly legal to sell it as bottled water. Back in 2011, the Fukushima Daiichi plant was struck by an earthquake and then the ensuing tsunami knocked out all power and backup power to the site, causing a total station blackout. This meant that the plant had no means of cooling and led to the reactor cores and spent fuel pools overheating to the point of a meltdown, the actual worst case scenario. After the accident, power was eventually restored, but because the reactors were so badly damaged, it wasn't possible to cool them using the normal methods. Instead, water had to be manually pumped into the cores, where it became radioactive and spilled through the cracks in what was left of the concrete at the bottom. The contaminated water was then collected and stored in tanks around the site. Radioactive particles in the water have a chance to cause cancer if the contaminated water is consumed by humans. So storing the water in large tanks makes sure it doesn't leak into the ocean or get into the groundwater. However, today the site has essentially run out of space, and Japan says it needs the room to further work on dismantling and cleanup. The only practical way to make space is to dump the water into the Pacific Ocean. Now, I hear what you're saying, that sounds like a really terrible idea. And while you'd be right, it's mostly the optics and PR of the situation, not the actual science. The contaminated water is first sent through a sophisticated system of filters that remove essentially all radioactive particles. Because these radioactive particles behave very differently from water molecules, this step is relatively easy and efficient. The problem comes when trying to filter out the lightest radioactive particle, specifically a particle called tritium, which behaves exactly like any other atom of hydrogen. Because it acts like any other hydrogen atom, it gets mixed up with all the other water molecules, H2O, and it becomes almost impossible to separate what is essentially water from water. Since there is no practical way to separate the radioactive tritium out from the rest of the water, the only option is to dilute it and reduce its concentration by using large amounts of seawater, essentially spreading it out over a very large area, so it's not all in one place and therefore no longer dangerous. Because at such low concentrations, it can't do any real harm. Once the tritium has has been spread out enough, its concentration is reduced below regulatory limits, and it's released back into the ocean. But because the tritium was only diluted and not entirely eliminated, a very small amount of it is still released, which is understandably making people concerned. If radioactive particles like tritium are in high enough concentrations, they can eventually lead to cancers, which I don't have to tell you is a bad thing. The World Health Organization gives a recommended limit on the amount of tritium in drinking water to be 10,000 becquerels per liter, which is just a way of measuring radioactivity. You don't need to know what a becquerel is, but instead, know that this amount corresponds responds to the risk of someone developing cancer to be less than 1 in 100,000 throughout their lifetime, assuming the person drinks 2 liters of contaminated water every day. For comparison, the overall lifetime risk of a Caucasian developing melanoma skin cancer, the kind primarily associated with spending a day in the sun, is just 1 in 38. Japan has committed to releasing the water from Fukushima at concentrations well below the WHO limit of 10,000 for drinking water, at no more than 1,500 becquerels per liter, and they've agreed to an international team of experts to monitor the release, including making all of the data publicly available. And all of this is before the water is actually released, where it mixes with the Pacific Ocean. The Fukushima site releases about 20,000 cubic meters of water per hour, compared to the 700 quadrillion cubic meters in the ocean itself a literal drop in the ocean. However, even with all this transparency, it still makes people uneasy about the whole thing, and I don't blame them. If someone from a damaged nuclear plant came to your house and started dumping barrels of water from their reactor core onto your lawn, or connected it to your faucet and shower, you might be understandably concerned. Even if they showed you that it was completely pure and had absolutely no traces of contamination, I'm willing to bet a lot of you would still think twice before you started drinking it. The head of the IEA, the UN agency performing oversight of the water release at Fukushima, recently went on a PR tour of the region, listening to residents concerns, explaining the science, and showing what the agency was doing to protect the environment and their safety. So the water from the Fukushima site has already been cleaned, and the tiny amount that remains pales in comparison to any meaningful statistic. Which leads to the second reason why it doesn't matter as much as people think, which is that, just generally, people are really bad at statistics. Now, of course, I don't mean you specifically, since I know the viewers of this channel are above average on nuclear matters. But as humans, we are programmed to avoid danger, to the point that we disproportionately avoid it even if the probability is low. The odds of someone being killed in a shark attack are less than the odds of winning the Powerball jackpot, or even picking a random person off the street to win a gold medal at the Olympics. But which one do people think about more? This warped perception of probabilities is especially true for things that we can't see or touch, like radiation. The general objection to releasing water from Fukushima is that the level of danger 
is directly proportional to the amount of radioactivity. The more contamination, the higher the risk of someone developing cancer in the future. The World Health Organization's recommended limit on tritium in drinking water of 10,000 becquerels per liter corresponds to a lifetime risk of someone developing cancer to be about 1 in 100,000. However, there was a lot of uncertainty on that number. Scientists know that after a certain point, a large exposure of radiation is always fatal. At medium levels, there are good statistics on probabilities of people developing cancer, mostly coming from exposures during the Manhattan Project. What they don't know, though, is what happens at very low levels of radiation. Because it becomes increasingly difficult to meaningfully separate the exact cause of any cancer that develops 20 years later. Did they eat too many burgers? Did they exercise only once a month? Was it existing genetics? Or was it standing too close to the microwave? There are simply too many variables. The best thing scientists can do is take the high and medium exposure data and extrapolate it down to the lower levels, assuming it is proportional. But when working with such small probabilities, it is essentially impossible to prove whether it's right or wrong. Therefore, the limits recommended by the WHO are just that recommendations. But they do come with the general consensus that at these levels, the risk to any individual person is so small that it's impossible to separate from the hundreds of other things they were doing every day anyway. But if there's anything that will help, it's understanding these probabilities and statistics to put things into a relative and meaningful perspective. And that's where today's sponsor Brilliant comes in. Determining and setting safe limits is a complex and vital task. But if there's one thing that can make the process more reliable and accurate, it's understanding probability and statistics. Most people want to see experts that understand probability and can apply it to guide policy that's based on solid science. They need to analyze the data that's available and identify trends and uncertainties that are useful for protecting people in the environment. Fortunately, Brilliant has you covered. Their whole probability course can help you grasp these concepts. The focus is on areas including applied probability, statistics fundamentals, distributions, and more. There are even new courses to help you explain variations in data and using probability to make predictions. Whether you're actually in a profession that could use it or just curious about how probability works in different scenarios, Brilliant is here to help. Brilliant's interactive approach makes it fun and easy. It doesn't feel like a long homework assignment. It feels like a story in a game, but you're actually learning something new. Best of all, you can learn from anywhere on your phone or computer. I was recently traveling for work, and even after a long day, it was easy for me to complete a new course from my hotel in the evening. Stand out in your field and use Brilliant to enhance your understanding of probability and its real-world applications. Get Brilliant for free for 30 days. Go to brilliant.org slash atomic blender, or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription, which is an excellent deal you won't want to miss. The third reason it doesn't matter so much if Fukushima is dumping treated water, is that we've gotten so good at detecting radioactivity, we can find it everywhere. Basic handheld radiation detectors can be found on Amazon for $100 and can measure the radioactivity of a banana. I'm not kidding. Check out the link in the description below. And yes, bananas are slightly radioactive. People with granite countertops or a basement are exposed to more radiation than those who don't. Someone living in Denver receives more radiation by just being there compared to someone in Chicago. Taking a flight from New York to LA will give you 400 times the amount of radiation compared to if you drank one pint of the Fukushima discharge water, meaning you could drink a glass of the stuff every day for a year and still receive less radiation than a normal commercial flight. And this ability to measure radiation is nothing compared to the equipment that scientists in a proper lab have access to. After all, if we can detect radiation from stars billions of light years away, we can certainly detect radiation standing over a tank of water back here on Earth. We can even see individual paths of radioactive particles traveling, something that is almost impossible to do with anything else. Since science has gotten so good at detecting radiation, we can now find the smallest bits of contamination, no matter how small or insignificant they are. After the initial disaster in Fukushima in 2011, which released substantially more before it was contained, it took two and a half years before ocean currents brought any evidence to the west coast of the US. And even then, scientists only found 0.008 becquerels per liter, or essentially zero when compared to the World Health Organization limits. All of this means that finding radioactive particles has become increasingly easy and cheap, even if there are so few of them, to the point that it's possible to find radioactivity in everything, even a banana. The fourth reason that Fukushima dumping treated water doesn't matter as much as people think is that a lot of the discussion is just political posturing by the countries involved. Neighboring countries like South Korea and China have a lot to lose just from the optics of Japan releasing water from the Fukushima site, even if that water was completely pure. Japan and many other countries in the Pacific rely heavily on commercial fishing for food and export. Reasonable or not, China has already placed a ban on Japanese seafood, which will have real effects on people's jobs in the fishing industry. Fukushima still has a fishing industry, but again, how comfortable would you be if you were at a supermarket and you saw a fish label as being from Fukushima? Demand for seafood and other products will be reduced if people think there is a possibility of contamination, and no amount of scientific reports or government assurance will convince people otherwise. These industries generate billions of dollars in revenue, and any decline will have a serious impact on people's employment. These countries therefore have a vested interest in maintaining these industries and their reputations. Maybe even most frustratingly, other countries have no direct control over what Japan does, and limited choices when it comes to any legal action. It's not like China can call the police or report Japan to the local health department. The closest authority they have is the IAEA, which has already blessed off Japan's plan for release. China and 
Russia made a joint submission to the IEA, saying Japan was only releasing the water into the ocean for cost reasons without fully considering the impact on its neighbors, and that other options were available, such as boiling it off into the air instead. If you seriously think that's going to be any better than releasing it into the ocean, then you've never experienced rain. But that's not the point. Winning in politics is. The fifth reason is that long-term storage of contaminated water in tanks has its own risks, including potential future earthquakes. But luckily we know how to handle nuclear waste, so go watch my video on how we've already solved the nuclear waste problem, but still choose not to. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to visit brilliant.org slash atomic blender to get your free 30 days of premium access. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.